In a typical argument about point 0.9 recurring, person A says point 0.9 recurring is exactly equal to 1, and person B says, that's ridiculous, point 0.9 recurring is obviously less than 1, and then person A says, well that's just your intuition, we need to put aside intuition because I have a proof. And then person A will present one of the standard supposed proofs that 0.9 recurring is equal to 1. But the problem is that all of these commonly presented supposed proofs do not, in and of themselves, actually meet the standards of a rigorous mathematical proof. They're what I would call physicist-style derivations rather than rigorous proofs. No offence to physicists. In actual rigorous mathematics, we need absolutely precise definitions, such as the definition of real numbers and the definition of how to evaluate an infinite decimal expression, and ideally we'd also want some kind of justification that the particular definitions chosen are sensible or useful. Now sometimes that can be self-evident from the definitions themselves, but sometimes not so much, in which case it's good if a justification is provided. But in any case, once the precise definitions are in place, rigorous mathematics then proceeds through a sequence of absolutely watertight steps of pure logical reasoning regarding the logically necessary consequences of the established definitions. Now, to fully tackle the issue of 0.9 recurring at that level of mathematical rigour would require university-level mathematics, and that's not what I want to do here, although in a paradoxical irony, when you have that university-level mathematics in place, you see that these standard derivations are actually overcomplicating things. So now, whereas people often say, put aside intuition and look at my proof, what I want to do is the reverse. I want to say, let's not worry about proof for now, let's just see if we can build a nice intuition for why it should make sense to say that 0.9 recurring is exactly equal to 1. And my reason for wanting to do this is not that it would be too complicated to give an overview of a rigorous approach to 0.9 recurring, but one of the steps at the definitions stage might feel a bit dissatisfying without further justification, and in my opinion, one of the important justifications is a branch of mathematics known as measure theory, which is basically built on the picture that I'm about to present. So, suppose there's a test with a hundred questions on it and each question is marked simply as either right or wrong, so the set of possible scores on the test is the integers from 0 up to 100. Now, we could divide the set of possible scores into adjacent bands, so we could have that the first band is from 0 inclusive up to 40 exclusive, and we could have that the second band is from 40 inclusive up to 75 exclusive, and we could have that the third band is from 75 inclusive up to 100 exclusive, and then, of course, the perfect score is 100. Now, these first three adjacent bands can be combined into one single band, the set of all non-perfect scores, which goes from 0 inclusive up to 100 exclusive. Now, how many different possible scores are there in band 1? Well, let's be careful, it's the integers from 0 inclusive up to 40 exclusive, and so that makes 40 possible scores. And then the number of possible scores in band 2, so that's 40 inclusive up to 75 exclusive, that comes to 35 possible scores. And then the number of possible scores in band 3, that's 75 inclusive up to 100 exclusive, that comes to 25 possible scores. OK, now let's consider this column of numbers and say we want to find the total of the numbers in this column. Well, that total is, of course, equal to the number of possible scores in the combined band of all three bands, and so that is from 0 inclusive up to 100 exclusive, and so that makes 100. Now, all of this discussion so far has been about discrete whole numbers, integers. I now want to consider the continuous number line of real numbers. So, imagine we have a one-dimensional number line, like this, and I want to imagine that our number line is actually made of physical matter with a uniform distribution of mass along its length. Now, let's consider the stretch of the number line defined by the real numbers going from 0 inclusive up to 1 exclusive, and let's call the mass of this stretch of the number line m. Now, we can divide this stretch of the number line into 10 parts, where the first part is the stretch going from 0 inclusive up to 0.1 exclusive, 
And the second part is the stretch going from 0.1 inclusive up to 0.2 exclusive. And the third part is the stretch going from 0.2 inclusive up to 0.3 exclusive. And so on until we reach the tenth part, which is the stretch going from 0.9 inclusive up to 1 exclusive. Now, since the number line has uniform density along its length, all of these ten pieces of the number line have the same mass as each other. And since these ten pieces together constitute the original stretch going from 0 inclusive up to 1 exclusive, the total mass of these ten pieces is precisely the mass of the original stretch, namely m. And so the mass of each one of the ten pieces is equal to a tenth of m. And now, if we consider the stretch of the number line constituted by the first nine of these ten pieces, that will be the stretch going from 0 inclusive up to 0 0.9 exclusive, and its mass will be equal to the total mass of those nine pieces, which comes to 9 tenths times m. Now, let's consider another stretch of the number line adjacent to the one that we just considered, namely, Let's consider the stretch going from 0.9 inclusive up to 0.99 exclusive. What's the mass of this stretch? It's 9 hundredths of m. To justify this, well, remember how we divided our original stretch into 10 parts all having the same mass as each other? Well, we could just as well have divided our original stretch into 100 parts in the same manner. So again, all of the 100 parts would have the same mass as each other, and then the combined stretch of the 91st through to the 99th parts would constitute exactly this stretch going from 0.9 inclusive up to 0.99 exclusive. And so it follows that the mass of this stretch is 9 hundredths of m. And continuing the pattern, we can form an infinite sequence of adjacent pieces of the number line as shown. And each of these pieces has the mass that you'd expect. So the sequence of masses here goes 9 tenths of m, then 9 hundredths of m, then 9 thousandths of m, and so on. And now I want to ask, what section of the number line is occupied by this infinite collection of pieces of the number line? Well, the answer is, it's the section of the number line going from 0 inclusive up to 1 exclusive. And therefore, the mass of this section is equal to the total of all of the masses of the constituent pieces here. And we can refer to this total value as 0.9 recurring times m, because there's a 9 in the tenths place, and a 9 in the hundredths place, and a 9 in the thousandths place, and so on. But of course, by definition, the mass of this stretch going from 0 inclusive up to 1 exclusive was precisely our original m. So we have that m is equal to 0.9 recurring times m, and so 1 is equal to 0.9 recurring. Now, some of the particularly nerdy types among you might be thinking, what happens if we work in a number system where we allow the existence of infinitesimal discrepancies between positions on the number line? Well, infinitesimals are a rather dodgy business, but what we could do is to say, for each of our stretches of the number line defined by the inclusion of a lower boundary value and the exclusion of an upper boundary value, let's simply also include all the numbers that are infinitesimally below the lower boundary value, while at the same time also excluding all the numbers that are infinitesimally below the upper boundary value. And by doing this, all of the arguments that I presented in this video will still go through in the same way as they did already. Now also, some of you might be wondering, we have here this set of pieces of the number line that together take up a length of exactly one. But since there are infinitely many pieces present in this set, might it be possible, in view of all of the paradoxes of infinity, that we could uproot these pieces out of their place in the number line and reassemble them in a rearranged manner to make the resulting length different from one, even though each individual constituent piece still retains its original length? And the answer is no. No matter how you reassemble the pieces, the resulting overall stretch will still always have a length of exactly one. Now, the proof of this fact is not at all obvious, but it is true. Well, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for watching.